Hello everybody, welcome to the video on Kepler's Laws of Planetary Motion. Kepler proposed three laws regarding the motion of planets around the star, that is the Sun, in the solar system. The first law states that the planets which orbit the Sun, they do so in an elliptical path, rather than a circular one. And which we'll see in a moment, when planets orbit the Sun in an elliptical path, the position of the Sun occupies one of the foci of the ellipse. The second law states that an imaginary line when drawn from the planet to the sun will sweep out equal area in equal time. We'll have a look at the first and second law together very in a moment. The third law states that the average radius of orbit of the planet is directly proportional to the square of the planet's orbital period, that is the time taken to complete one revolution of the elliptical orbit. The proportionality constant is the same for objects or planets that orbit the same star or the same central mass. This diagram demonstrates Kepler's first and second law of planetary motion. When planets orbit the Sun, they undergo an elliptical path, where the Sun occupies one of the foci positions. A focus is sort of like the center of a circle, but for ellipses. An ellipse always has two foci one over here and the other one will be over here somewhere. The Sun, which is a star that the planets orbit around, will occupy one of the two foci. So it could be the left one or the right one. As you can see, in an elliptical orbit, the orbital radius of the planet will change throughout the orbit. When the orbital radius is smaller, the orbital velocity of the planet will be faster. This is because the orbital velocity is given by the square root of G capital M, where capital M is the mass of the Sun, divided by the orbital velocity. If the orbital radius is smaller, then this will give us a faster orbital velocity. Vice versa, on the other side of the elliptical, of the elliptical path, when the radius is longer, the orbital velocity is slower. So since the orbital velocity is different throughout the motion, the distance covered by the planet as they orbit the sun will be ultimately different as well, depending on the velocities. And this is where we'll segue into the Kepler's second law of planetary motion. Imagine if we have a line that's drawn from a particular planet, so that's planet Earth. If we draw a line from the planet Earth to the sun, and if we follow this line as the Earth orbits around the sun, this line will eventually sweep out an area of the ellipse. In Kepler's second law of motion, he states that in motions of the planet that take the same amount of time, the area swept by the imaginary line will be exactly equal. So on the left-hand side, when planet Earth is traveling faster, it will cover a greater distance in the orbit. In contrast, on the other side of the ellipse, when Earth is moving slower, it will cover a shorter distance. However, due to the longer radius, the area swept by this motion will be exactly equal to the original area that was swept when Earth was traveling faster. So hypothetically, if Earth takes one month to travel from this point, point A, to point B, then it will sweep an area that's called this A1. On the other side, if Earth also takes exactly one month to go from point C to point D, then this area A2 will be exactly equal to A1. So that is the area swept by this line between the star and the planet will be identical if the time taken to make these areas are equal, that is one month. Kepler's third law states that the average radius of orbit this is denoted by r, is directly proportional to the square of its period. In the equation form, this can be expressed as r cubed equal to a constant, that's called as k, multiplied by capital T squared, where t is a period. This constant here, which is known as the proportionality constant, that's k, is the same for any object orbiting the same common mass. So in other words, this constant will be the same for all the planets in our solar system because they all orbit the Sun. So planets orbiting the same star, for, for example, the Sun, 
will share the same proportionality constant k. We can derive a, a more thorough e equation for Kepler's third law by combining what we know about uniform circular motion and orbital velocity. So if we make the simplifying assumption that planet's orbital motion around the star is circular, then we can say that the velocity of the planet is equal to the circumference of the circle, 2 pi r, divided by the time taken to complete one revolution, one the, which is a period. The orbital velocity formula can also be used as this is equal to the square root of g m over r. When a planet is orbiting around the star in a circular motion, the value of these two velocities will be equal. So thus, this allows us to equate them in a mathematical sense. And by scoring both sides, I can get the following expression. If I times the radius on both sides of the equation, I will get r cubed on the left-hand side in the numerator. And if I divide 4 pi squared on both sides, I can get 4 pi squared in the denominator on the right-hand side. This is a common expression for Kepler's third law of planetary motion. If we take r cubed, so that's the radius cubed, divided by the orbital period squared, this equals to a constant value. The reason why I said this is a constant value is because g is our universal constant of gravitation, m is mass of the central mass, so if we're talking about planets in the solar system, this is mass of the sun, which we assume stays the same. And 4 pi squared is a constant as well. So previously when we said the cube of the radius is directly proportional to the square of the period, this proportionality constant k is actually equal to gm over 4 pi squared. Assuming the orbital period of Earth around the Sun is 365 days, so this is my period, calculate the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So distance here is the radius of orbit r. The reason why they're asking for the average radius is because the Earth doesn't actually undergo a circular path around the Sun. The path it takes is elliptical, as outlined by Kepler's first law. Use the following information in your calculation. So we're given the mass of the Sun as well as mass of the Earth. Kepler's third law are great for calculating questions such as this one. We are given information on the orbital period as well as mass of the central star around which the Earth orbits. And we need to calculate the radius here. So we can multiply both sides by t squared to get r cubed is equal to gm period squared divided by 4 pi squared. And we can take the cube root on both sides to get r equals to cube root gm t squared divided by 4 pi squared. Now we know the gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to minus 11, times by mass. Now mass here in Kepler's third law equation, this always corresponds to the mass of the central star or the central object around which uh, the smaller mass usually orbit around. So in this case, it is mass of the sun. We don't need the mass of the Earth for this calculation. And the period here is 365 days. But we need to convert this into the SI unit in seconds by time z, by 24, by 60, and by 60 again. There's 24 hours in one day, 60 minutes in one hour, and 60 seconds in one minute. So this will be 365 days times by 24 hours times by 60 minutes times by 60 seconds and then don't forget to square this so this t squared and then this is all divided by 4 pi squared and everything here again don't forget to cube root everything and this will give us the answer in the calculator which is 1.50 times 10 power of 11 meters a satellite orbits the planet Zerus in a circular path with a radius of 4 times 10 power 6 meters and an orbital period of 4 hours. Calculate the period of a satellite orbiting the same planet but at a radius of 1.5 times 10 power 7 meters. Now as we said, when it comes to different objects orbiting the same central mass, the proportionality constant k in Kepler's third law will be equal. What does this mean? 
That means if we take the orbital radius of the first satellite, cube that, and we divide it by the period of the first satellite is squared, this will give us the same constant as the ratio between the orbital radius of the second satellite cubed divided by the orbital period of the second satellite squared, both of which will equal to the same constant, which is equivalent to gm over 4 pi squared, where the big M here is mass of the planet. So we know that r1 cubed divided by t1 squared is equal to r2 cubed divided by t2 squared. Make this clearer, r1 and t1 are the radius of the first satellite respectively. Okay, so this is r1 and this is t1. And this radius here, this will be r2. So we can multiply both sides here by t2 squared to get t2 squared is equal to r2 cubed multiplied by t1 squared divided by r1 cubed. And we can square both sides. So t2 equals to the square roots of r2 cubed times by t1 squared divided by r1 cubed. So t2 here equals to, so r2 here is the radius of the second satellite. So 1.5 times 10 power, 11, power of 7 cubed times by t1 squared. So t1 is the period of the first satellite. So we're going to leave this 4 hours. We don't need to use seconds here because if we can use hours in the period, the unit for the second period that we calculate for the second satellite, so t2, will also be in hours. You can convert the time here, the period to seconds, but this will mean your period will be in seconds. Either way, you'll be able to calculate the period of the second satellite. So this is divided by r1 cubed. So r1 is the radius of the first satellite. So this will be 4 times 10 power 6. And everything here will be square rooted. And this gives me a random answer of 29 hours.